Welcome, Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel, and uh, really excited to have as a guest today, Vince Filateo, a professor in the departments of psychiatry and neurosciences. Vince has been at UCSD for now 17 years, doing very interesting work in the area of neurocognitive function and its clinical counterparts and extensions. So Vince, welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about you and, and, and the exciting work you're doing. Well, I am a neuropsychologist who does both experimental clinical um, work in that area. And my primary focus has been in working with individuals with movement disorders, mm -hmm. uh, primarily uh, patients with Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And we've been interested in all facets of the disease in terms of trying to understand some of the neuropsychological deficits, psychiatric changes, and how those relate to such things as quality of life um, in terms of uh, early diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and just the natural progression of the disease. You know, not everybody, uh, well, I would say it this way, lots of people think that Parkinson's disease is just a movement disorder, that there are no particularly interesting cognitive elements there. Tell us more about cognition and Parkinson's. Well, cognition is a very prominent feature of the disease, and in fact, in many situations, it predicts more so in terms of quality of life than do the motor symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we tend to see in some of our work that the psychiatric symptoms and the cognitive symptoms are better predictors of how mm -hmm. patients perceive their quality of life than are the motor symptoms themselves. And when you think about the localization, if you will, of, of, the, of, the, of the symptoms that are cognitive, what do we know about that? So our understanding in terms of the cognitive deficits in Parkinson's is that at least initially, most of the deficiencies are in an area of cognition referred to as executive functioning. Mm -hmm. And that is such things as problem solving, abstract reasoning, multitasking, working memory, and so forth. And our understanding of the neurobiological bases of those processes is that they tend to be subserved by the regions that are connected between the frontal lobes and the basal ganglia, primarily the, the head of the caudate in, in uh, the basal ganglia. So it's a circuit, <clears throat> and the elements of the circuit are abnormal, and there's both then motor manifestations and also these changes in cognition, this executive function piece that you refer to is, a, is an early and prominent part of, the, of this so-called movement disorder. Yes, in fact, um, approximately 25% of patients who are just diagnosed with Parkinson's disease have cognitive deficits in at least one domain mm -hmm. of function, primarily mm -hmm. executive functioning. What do people complain about at this stage of their illness? So in the early stages, the, what they notice mostly are the movement problems because mm -hmm. those are the most obvious to, to them and their family members. Mm -hmm. But as we delve into interviewing the patients, trying to better understand what their problems are, we're finding that there are a whole host of issues that are going on before the movement symptoms even start to occur. Mm -hmm. There's now this concept of prodromal Parkinson's disease that's gained popularity. And the idea is, is that there's a number of different non-motor symptoms that are actually present prior to the onset of the cardinal motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Those include things such as the cognitive deficits, but there's also psychiatric problems that can occur very early on in the course including anxiety, depression, apathy, and so forth. But then there are also other types of more physical symptoms, such as constipation. Mm -hmm. So when you interview such patients and you point out that you're pretty sure there's a problem with one of these cognitive functions, and you ask them how long they've experienced them, what, what do they give you? What sort of time frame do they give you before the onset of motor symptoms? Well, it's highly variable from patient to patient. That's actually one of the more fascinating aspects of the disease mm. is just how it can present in such a heterogeneous mm. uh, nature. Um, some patients will say, yes, I've had difficulty in terms of functioning for the past three, five years or mm. so forth. And mm. some actually don't have any problems quite yet. Mm -hmm. um, but those that do, they are really able to kind of describe some of the difficulties they have. And then we hear from the family members, too, that these problems have been going on for a long time. And we'll typically hear things like, yes, I used to be able to do multiple things at the same time. I had great problem-solving abilities, and now I just can't do those things at the level that I was capable of before. So that's really fascinating because, again, it, it looks at the, the disorder as a, really a circuit disorder. 
some circuits are more vulnerable than others, and some circuits that are changing give symptoms before others. So it's a, it's a real interesting mix of changes, a real puzzle for you guys to figure out in the clinic, and that's what you do. Yes. You're trying to sort out what's going on here, and not just in the individual patient, but more generally in the brain, and more generally even than that, how do I intervene? How do I know how to work to help this patient deal with their issues? Speak a little bit about the work that you do at a very practical level, from the clinic, if you will, or from the basic science all the way to, the, to clinical care. Yeah. And that's some of the more exciting aspects of Parkinson's research these days. I mean, we've been very good at characterizing a lot of the difficulties that they have in terms of cognition, mood, and motor function. But only recently have there been um, programs that have been developed to really help intervene in all three of those areas. So we're starting to learn more and more about such things as how exercise is extremely important in terms of cognition, um, not only in Parkinson's disease, but just healthy aging as well. Um, but there are some specific aspects of, of exercise that may be more important in, in Parkinson's, such as getting them to learn movements while, while doing other sort of cognitive type of tasks as well. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to exercise, there's more of the, uh, the um, compensatory um, types of, of approaches, which is basically teaching patients how to compensate for some of the cognitive deficits that they have. Mm -hmm. um, for example, simple things such as writing things down, following checklists, um, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's also more of a reparative approach, which is things such as the video games that we hear about on, on TV in terms of um, being able to go online and, and be able to do games that, that help with cognition. Um, and then a third thing, or a fourth thing that we, we've been interested in is um, other types of interventions, such as mindfulness training, mm. which is geared towards teaching people more meditative type of processes with the idea that with reduced anxiety comes reduced motor symptoms um, mm. as well as cognitive problems. So there are multiple approaches these days that we uh, are providing um, advice to our patients to and now starting to start clinical studies to look to see whether or not there's any empirical basis for these interventions. So on the mindfulness side of the, of the ledger, what do people tell you about the effect of meditation on their symptoms? So in the few patients, we're just barely getting started on this, but one, they really enjoy the mindfulness training. They've gone through the program here at UCSD, mm -hmm. and it has been very helpful in terms of just them being able to calm themselves down, for them to be able to focus in terms of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of uh, mindfulness training is, is based in terms of trying to get people to focus, which is mm -hmm. a very big problem that you have in Parkinson's disease. Some of my earlier um, research looking at more basic cognitive processing in Parkinson's disease demonstrated a significant deficit in their ability to attend selectively to visual information. Mm -hmm. And so we're hoping that that's good, the mindfulness training will help in terms of that. So specifically focusing on attention, are there, are there methods that you could say, well, uh, we think this behavioral intervention would really help with attention, or we think this medicine that we might offer will really help with attention. What, 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 what's the armamentarium we have then for patients if that attention issue is something that comes up? Well, right now we really don't have much in the way of doing that. We know that the dopamine and um, levodopa types of medications do help in certain aspects of cognition. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. fact, it helps with things like working memory, mm -hmm. the ability to remember someone's phone number that was just given to you. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, sometimes the medications can hurt different aspects of attention, and mm -hmm. one of those is selective attention. Yeah. So with Parkinson's disease, it's always a balancing act between mm -hmm. helping with one aspect of the disease but hurting another, mm -hmm. and some of the medications will do that. We're hoping in terms of mindfulness training that that um, is a viable option in terms of helping improving the attention deficits that they have. You know, you can imagine the neurobiology of this, you can imagine that there's a there's an element of uh, increasing the uh, attention, and there's another element that you could just imagine, you could characterize it as decreasing the noise in the system. Uh, both would be relevant to the ability to perform cognitively. You can imagine then that there are things like mindfulness-based stress reduction that could decrease the noise, you know, uh, reduce 
the chaos in your brain. Reduce the number of tasks that you're forcing yourself to engage in. And whatever attentional uh, horsepower is left, go ahead and let that work. But one's also interested in the idea of just enhancing attention, either through behavioral approaches or through uh, drugs, through medicine. Um, it's very interesting in Parkinson's disease, uh, the locus ceruleus is pretty heavily impacted, and that's a major pathway that sends, their, sends these axons all across the brain. Um, are there approaches to address def deficits in norepinephrine in, in, the, in the Parkinson's brain at this point? At this point, no. I mean, but I do think that that is a, a, certainly a target area in terms of that brain structure. But at this point, we don't have a clear understanding of what, why they do have these attention problems. Yes. So you're going to have to pursue that first before you get a good purchase on whether those kinds of therapies would make a, make a difference. Exactly. And really, the basal ganglia, in terms of what it's thought to do, mm. is very much to enhance a wanted signal and to inhibit an unwanted signal, which is very akin to what you're describing in terms of the target and the noise. Yeah, for sure. It's a, the brain's really complicated, and it, it, when it's involved, it, so many different manifestations emerge. But this is exciting stuff. So what are we looking at, uh, Vince, for the next five or ten years in terms of progress in Parkinson's disease and specifically in helping with these cognitive issues? So one right now, we, we, I think early detection is a very important thing and mm -hmm. this concept of prodromal Parkinson's and cognition being a part of that I think is key mm -hmm. to understanding that. Mm -hmm. What we really would like to do is to be able to identify patients far before the motor symptoms um, emerge and far before any significant cognitive problems emerge because that's going to be the point that we're going to want right. to target. Um, I also see uh, these types of interventions that we've been discussing um, coming to fruition in terms of them demonstrating the, the empirical evidence to support their use, and then really trying to find out what are the important elements of those interventions that are most important so that we can distill those down. Um, I think it's a very exciting time at this point because we, in the past, had nothing to offer our patients. It would be, you have cognitive problems, mm -hmm. let us know when it gets worse and we'll test you again. Now we actually can say something to them and I feel in the next five years or so, we're going to be able to say more precisely what it is you should do, whether it be an aerobic type of exercise, a skill-based exercise, all those types of things I think we'll have a better understanding. And I think another really important area, too, that we will have a better understanding of is just how do the psychiatric um, manifestations of the disease impact other aspects of, of thinking and so forth. So we've been interested in looking at apathy in Parkinson's hmm. disease, which is a very understudied area and really not well recognized, whereas in our sample that we're following at UCSD and the VA, um, about 40% of our patients have clinical levels of apathy, mm. and that's associated with their cognitive difficulties that they have, as well as their quality of life, as you might imagine. Sure. So I think finding not just um, the uh, interventions for the cognitive problems, but also being able to better characterize the other symptoms that might contribute to the cognitive difficulties. I think that's kind of where we're going as far as our research. It's an exciting future. We're very pleased that you're part of it, UCSD is part of it, and thanks for coming. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it, Vince. Yeah. Bill Mobley for On Our Mind.